Hello, 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 testing. Oh, s I just lost the checklist. <laughs> Good one! I'm Jason Miller, a full-time professional flight instructor. On the Finer Points channel, you can join me as I bring you tips and tricks that I've learned from 20 years on the flight line. Welcome back to the Finer Points. Well, my friends, I am here at Kegu, which is actually a Nevada County Airport, my new semi-home base, and I'm commuting from here in Nevada County back to the Bay Area to do my lessons. Um, so far, I've been taking the motorhome down, staying overnight, doing lessons and that kind of thing. Sometimes I'll drive it there and back in a day, um, but I can tell pretty quick that this is not going to be sustainable. I think it's a perfect excuse to pull the trigger on a lifelong dream of buying and owning my own airplane. Um, now I'm doing that on a CFI budget, so I, this will be a great experience. I'm going to tell you guys the story, kind of bring you along through the entire process. Um, but if you're wondering how in the world you could ever afford an airplane, uh, we're going to figure that part out together. So I noticed one day I was here at Nevada County Airport and I'm in the, you know, the pilot's lounge there and I'm just looking at the bulletin board, which is always an awesome thing to do. Um, and one thing jumped out at me, it was um, champagne on a beer budget was I think the headline. And it was a, a share of a bonanza for $9,000 and it just said to contact Juan Brown. And I thought, well, gosh, I know that name, Juan Brown. And uh, if you haven't seen the Blanco Lirio channel, you should definitely go check it out. But that is Juan Brown's channel. And uh, we are actually sharing a home base for a while. So um, I had never met Juan, but I reached out to him and we got together to take a look at that, what is a 1952 Bonanza. And um, I'm going to show you in this video why I think that's an awesome airplane, but just not the right one for me and my family, even though the price was perfect. Let's take a look. We started off in the hangar and the first clue that I got that this might not be the airplane I want to put my kids in uh, was when Juan was explaining the fuel system to me. The fuel system in the Bonanza has two 20 gallon main tanks, 20 gallons in the left wing, 20 gallons in the right wing. Those fuel tanks each have 17 gallons usable. 17, 18, 19, 20. So that's three gallons per tank that is unusable. This particular Bonanza, very common modification, also has a 10 gallon auxiliary fuel tank located in the baggage compartment. So now we have a left tank, a right tank, and an auxiliary tank. This E225-11 engine is powered by a, or carbureted with a PS5C pressure carburetor. If any of you have done aerobatics before, you might be familiar with that. It's a carburetor that works in all attitudes of flight. It's a pressure carburetor. That means it pumps more fuel than it needs. So the PS5C carburetor pumps an extra three gallons per hour, and that extra fuel goes back into the left tank. So you have to be aware of the fuel return system and how it operates in the Beechcraft Bonanza. That means you always want to take off with full tanks, at least mostly full tanks, and then you always want to start your flight out on the left tank. You need to burn the fuel down on the left tank to a point where you can then switch tanks and allow that three gallons per hour to return to the left tank with adequate room in that tank without overfilling that tank, or it'll just spill out right out of the top of the fuel cap. So you have three fuel tanks, three gallons per hour uh, surplus fuel from the PS5C carburetor. You have a fuel selector switch which has four positions, left, right, aux, and off. And here's the kicker, back to the style points in 1952, you only have one single fuel gauge right here to manage the left and right tanks. Wow. And the aux tank. Plus you have two switches, <laughs> to manage this one fuel gauge. So you gotta keep track of your fuel. So many bonanzas have been lost to people mismanaging the fuel and running out of gas at a critical phase of flight and having plenty of fuel remaining in an additional tank. And this is a common problem with a lot of older 
aircraft. Yeah, you heard him right. The engine returns fuel to the left tank, to the left tank only, is constantly doing that, and there's one gauge that you have to select which tank you're reading off of. It's not like that's impossible. You know, I've definitely flown complex airplanes. It's just that if I'm gonna put my kids in there, my wife, and go on long trips, um, each little thing that cranks up the workload is a potential to make a mistake. So um, that wasn't awesome to kind of see that that's how the fuel system runs, but I still wasn't out of the running for the airplane. Um, and we decided to jump in. You know, Juan is an airline pilot. He's a former Cal Fire pilot. And it was pretty cool kind of going through procedures because everything that I teach is for a single pilot world. And uh, Juan does primarily most of his flying in a, in a two crew environment. Um, so it was really kind of fun to, to work with procedures um, as we took the Bonanza out to the run up area. All right, now we can finish up that start checklist. We got good oil. Uh, <coughs> check one, you got me in there? Got you loud and clear. Okay, so start, we did uh, ignition. We started it. On both. Okay, yeah. we primed oil pressure. It's good. Lights. Are set. Mixture. Is leaned. All right, do you want the pre-taxi checklist? Yeah, let's do that. All right, seat belts. On. Flaps. Up. Heat. Vents. Defrost. Uh, that's, that's a good idea. Let's open. Uh, avionics. Let's get those going. There's no master, just individual there. Yep. And let me set this up real quick here. 122.725 for local. And we're going to go to Auburn, 122.7. Let's go um, 125.4 for no, no, NorCal. Set 122.7 here. So we got all the radio set up for the operation. We're going to go from here, do a little air work, and down to Auburn. Great. Clear the pattern. I love it, man. You're so old school. Do you, do you, would you, do you think I should still be teaching these 360s in the run-up at non-towered fields? Yeah. Heck yeah. Because people come in from anywhere, huh? Anywhere and everywhere. All right. Yep. You officially just added that back into the... I ditched that a while ago, and I don't know uh. why. Love that. Old school flying. Everybody, you know, back in the day used to make me do that 360 in the run-up area at non-towered airports. Um, but, you know, all my home bases have been towered airports and busy airspace. And so even though I taught that procedure for so many years, it's one of the procedures I've been a little lazy at continuing to press my pilots on. Uh, so it was interesting to see Juan do it and explain why that the fire bombers, the tankers, come in on the opposite runway. So uh, very important. People can be coming in, as Juan said, from anywhere. So that was very cool. Um, but here we're about to see the second thing that sort of raised my attention when it came to this airplane, and that is Juan, who's the mechanic of the airplane, asked me to stare at the fuel flow all through the takeoff roll. So back me up on the engine instruments as we blast off down the road. You got it. That fuel flow will be that first indication of an engine failure if it's a fuel problem right there. Roger. So it'll take a little bit of right rudder for the torque. Winds are light out of the west. RPM checks. Gauges are good. We just fly the aircraft off of the runway. We don't pull on a hard rotate speed. I like it. Okay, okay so we're looking at the end of the runway there. Gauges are looking good. This is the gear. The gear is coming up. And we got that one minute limitation on the engine. So we're gonna take it from the yellow arc down into the green arc with the propeller. And you so just leave the manifold where manifold it is. Manifold where it is, because we're at our density altitude and our elevation here today, we're just barely pulling 25 inches. Got it. First part of the plan was to just take the airplane up and kind of, you know, get Juan back into the groove of things. So he's just doing air work. Um, and he's really a great stick. I noticed the coordination was spot on, and I think it's because of all of his tailwheel flying. So if you haven't yet gotten your tailwheel endorsement, that is definitely a worthwhile investment. Your coordination has been awesome. Is that just because you're really good, or is it a pretty easy plane to fly? It's easy plane to fly, and a, most of my time is in old tail draggers, old luscums. And that, that will really tighten up your coordination. Yeah, nice. So anytime I get up in a different airplane, or I've been a while, or... I'm changing planes. I want to find out exactly what airspeed does the thing stall at. Does it have a warning horn or a warning light? We'll find out. Should have <laughs> both. <laughs> Should have both working. Oh, yeah, there's a horn. This light here should light up. 
Yeah, it does. There it is. You can feel a burble now. Uh, you can I feel the tail. Yeah. Look at it. It just hangs on right there at 60, 65. You're not kidding. This will really hang on there, huh? Nice. Just impressed with Beach. It feels like they really thought the planes through. Yes. Yeah. Right after a few stalls, we were on our way to see some of Juan's friends down at Auburn. Uh, that is Alpha Uniform November. If you haven't been there, what a cool airport community they have. Um, it's always one of my favorite places to stop. And it was cool going there with Juan because I'm pretty sure that he knows everybody. All right, quick uh, review of that before landing checklist. All right, landing light is on. Autopilot is off. Off, not stalled. All right, uh, car beat off. Gas. Left tank, left tank's full. Undercarriage. Down. Should we see a green? Yeah, we got a green light here. It's because I turned that light on. Now you got a green light. Checks. Roger. Um, mixture. Final is clear. Mixture is rich. Prop. Prop is in. All right, flaps. Coming down. And seat belts. See, there I went for the gear instead of the flaps. 500 AGL, checklist complete. Gas, undercarriage, mixture, prop. All right, there's the Bonanza behind us. No factor. This dude is rolling out. Should work out sweet. Yep. Plenty of airspeed. Auburn area traffic, red and white Bonanza turning left base for runway 25 behind the other aircraft on final. Auburn. Zero two, Char Zero two Charlie, short final 25, Auburn. Full stop. Auburn Cobra, Cessna 6280, box draw, uh, clear runway 25, Auburn. He's clear, we got the active. Gear is down, gear is down. Auburn area traffic, red and white print, uh, banana bit turning base to final runway 25, Auburn. We'll be clearing here at Delta. All right, can I crack the door? Yep. Try not to lose the checklist this time. Yeah, thank you. He introduced me to one of his friends here who actually built this airplane and talked us through all the different design features and the choices he made. Uh, it was a really, really fun afternoon. But before too long, Juan and I jumped back into the Bonanza for the return trip to Auburn. And Juan made, almost made, one of the classic mistakes. And I think that was the point at which I was out of the running on this 1952 Bonanza. Even though it was only $9,000, if somebody as good as Juan and is the mechanic of the airplane and has a lot of time in that airplane, could even potentially make the mistake that he made, I figure we've learned a lot since 1952 and I'm gonna keep shopping. This is the gear, the gear's coming down. I love the way you do that. Yeah. Uh, you always call it and then push it, huh? Yeah. So let's talk about that beautiful piano key switch design, which is admittedly very, very cool, but prone to mistakes. I mean, take a look at Juan going into Auburn. Now consider that Juan is an awesome pilot. He's the mechanic of this airplane and he's got lots of experience in this airplane. And he almost made the classic mistake of putting down the wrong little piano key switch. All right, flaps. Coming down. And seat belts. See, there I went for the gear instead of the flaps. Then later, going into Grass Valley, he, you know, intentionally does the procedure uh, that you really should do, which is grab the, the switch, say out loud what you're doing, look at it, verify it, and then actuate it. And that, that procedure is critical. But even so, a few seconds later, he almost makes the same mistake again. This is the gear, the gear's coming down. I love the way you do that. Yeah. Uh, you always call it and then push it, huh? Yeah. Call it out. Yep. I come in with the power just instinctively as the gear comes down and the drag increases. I can hear the gear lowering. I got a green light there. You can barely see it. And I got a gear down indication there. If you have a Bonanza with tip tanks, you also have a mirror to help you visually acquire that. And then here come the flaps. We are below 105. That's gear. See? see, look at that. Yeah, That's see, insane. three months. Here's right. the flaps. The flaps are coming down. Man, if you don't call it out like you do, you're asking for trouble. Yep. 
It's not like that's not a manageable procedure, but for me, when I think about putting my kids in the airplane, which are a distraction, my wife in the airplane, which, you know, she can be a distraction to any non-pilot can be a distraction. Um, each one of these things, the fuel management, the single fuel gauge, the piano key switches really just kind of, that was the nail in the coffin for me on the, on the 1952 Bonanza. Um, at least as the airplane I'm going to buy, uh, as my first airplane, if I can get that done to put my family in it and fly around. I I kind of want to keep it as simple as possible, you know, the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. 90 miles an hour around here. Traffic experimental 600 to one tango on extended downwind, turning right bank 25, Rio Vista, touch and go. You'll get a big updraft right in here, oh. and then a sinker, and then see how the airspeed went crazy high on yeah, the uh, yeah, yeah. traffic 25 northbound already. Uh, negative. Eight. We are about to turn now. Uh, Rio Vista. Uh, Rio Vista traffic, three tango off. And you're going to get a floater once five. I go past these numbers. Yeah, if I'm not on the ground, yeah. it'll float like crazy. Really? So I want to get it right down in here. So I want to get it right down right. there. There you go. And now watch, it'll, it'll see full aft. Watch this. I bet you I can get it to fly again. Wow. Almost. Just from the heat coming off the pavement. Well, and the way the the wind and everything blows. And just like that, we were back at Kegu. So a big thanks to Juan Brown for uh, letting, you know, showing me the Bonanza. Um, I'm certain now that even though the price is right, a 1952 airplane is probably not what I want to put my kids and my wife in there and fly around the country. Uh, but I'd love to own something like that someday when I have three planes in the hangar, maybe. <laughs> um, next, we're going to check out a 182 or a 180, and I'll bring you guys along for the ride on that. Um, because I think it's interesting trying to figure out how to get into this awesome world of general, general aviation um, even if you're not sitting on a mountain of money. So uh, hopefully we can do that and do that together. A big thanks to the sponsors and to the patrons. Without that support, these Finer Points videos just wouldn't be possible. And if you're interested in bonus content and supporting the Finer Points, please visit patreon.com slash learntfp. There's also a free gift video available at learnthefinerpoints.com and a full feature three-day trial, a free three-day trial of our Ground School app. Big thanks to you all, the best fans on the internet, for watching this video. Please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, share with your friends, hit the alarm bell, all that YouTube stuff. But most importantly, until next time, be safe and fly your best.